Hi everyone and welcome to the third episode in the series of the Databricks uh, Networking Deep Dive. The first part will be how to isolate, completely isolate the uh, workspace uh, using private endpoints for the back end and then the front end as well. The second part, we will move to the data exfiltration protection, which is how can we prevent anyone like who already has legitimate access to the workspace from leaking information outside the sources that we would like to have. In this case, we'll use a firewall, so we'll have all the traffic redirected to a firewall, and how can we make the firewall works with the Databricks implementation. Let's start with the whiteboard first and let's discuss all these uh, drawings here. I'm gonna first give them names. The first part is the data plane. Data plane, that's where we are uh, deploying our Databricks. The Databricks clusters will be deployed here. So subnet one, subnet two, these are uh, the two subnets that the clusters will be located in. Every machine will have two network cards, one per uh, each subnet. The, the name of the VNet here, the data plane is represented by um, a VNet called Databricks VNet. Right? We also have a subnet called Private Endpoint. In this subnet, during the time of the creation, we will create a private endpoint from the control plane to the subnet and that will be registered in a private DNS zone. So this is a private DNS zone. So the, the network traffic will be flowing from subnet 1 and subnet 2. I'm actually one of them, so let's say it's subnet 1. It used to be called before public, but now we don't have any public. Uh, so subnet 1, the traffic will flow from here, going to the private endpoint. First, it has to check what, what is the IP of my uh, control plane. It will check with the DNS zone, and the DNS zone will send it to the uh, private IP in the private endpoint. Uh, subnet and then it will reach out to the control plane. That's why we, we need to have the private DNS zone uh, connected or, or or the VNet is referencing this specific private DNS zone. Okay, so this is the first part. The control plane, nothing changed it it's as, as we saw before in the previous videos. Now the user area is represented by a VNet. We call it main data VNet. Main data VNet is a VNet. Has, it has actually many resources. It has specific uh, uh, subnet. It's called workstations. Inside this subnet, I have a VM here. So this is a VM. And that will be representing the um, the client connecting to our control plane. For this to happen, we need to have a private endpoint here, and I'm putting the private endpoint into a subnet called analytics. And of course, this has to be registered into private DNS zone that is referenced by this VNet. So what happens when the VM tries to speak with the, with the workspace? First, it will consult the uh, private DNS zone. What is my, uh, what's the IP for this workspace? It will be referred to uh, the private IP in the analytics subnet and it, that will take it directly to the, the workspace web interface. So we'll start our first demo by doing this diagram that we just described. Starting the demo by investigating the two VNets that we are using. The first VNet is called the Databricks VNet. 
and Databricks VNet has nothing on it. I cleaned everything, no delegation, no security groups, nothing inside this VNet. The other VNet, it's called Main Data VNet. This is the VNet that has our clients. So the workstation that has my client that we are testing with will be in this VNet. Let me show you the virtual machine as well. So the virtual machine is a Windows virtual machine here. And this virtual machine is connected to uh, the workstation subnet inside the main data VNet. All right. So now let's start by creating the workspace. Entering the initial information. And then in the networking side, we will use no public IPs injected inside a VNet. Our VNet will be Databrix VNet. As we know, the two subnets that we will inject into will be Databrix 1, Databrix 2. And now we will have something new, which is no public network access. So disable it. And uh, we will disable all the, all, not all, it's one rule, which is the NSG rules. We'll disable them, as we saw before in the previous video. Now, in here, we will create a private endpoint early on we, during the creation time. And this will, we will choose it as the back end private endpoint. Whether it's the back end or, or front end, there is no difference. Both of them are using the same sub resource. The difference is which one is connected to the data plane. Data plane here represented by Databrix 1, Databrix 2 subnets. So we are connecting the private endpoint to a a subnet called private endpoints which is inside the same vnet that has dataprex all right so let's create it check the resource launch it and we are expecting to have failures let's see the error message here you go the error message says that this workspace does not allow access from this network. All right, so let's continue by logging to our workstation and try from inside the workstation itself. Logging using Bastion. Here we go. Now let's give it a try and we are expecting to get the same error because until now we did not create the front end private endpoint yet. It's I'm copying and pasting the URL for the workstation for the workspace, sorry. Login. And here you go. The same error message. All right. So let's now try to create the front end private endpoint. We we'll go to private endpoint connections under my workspace. I see the back end private endpoint already created. Now we are creating the front end by we'll start by giving it a name. I always try to differentiate between them by writing front end or back end. So this one will be called front end. The location has to be the same location as the workspace. And then the sub resource here we will choose first Dataprex UI API. This is the private endpoint for both the web interface for Dataprex and the API for the for the Dataprex workspace. There is another one called browser authentication, which we will come to uh, create. We have to create one at least one per region, uh, but I'm not going to create it now. We'll create it after we face the error, so we understand it even better. I'm going to connect this one to the main data VNet because my client is in the main data VNet to the subnet called analytics and continuing to the DNS configuration. Now this DNS private zone is a new one because this one will be in the data resource group. The previous one was an ADB demo resource group. So I have two private uh, zones, one for the back end and one for front end. Can I 
Can I have one only? Yes, you can have one. As long as the front end, the back end can reach out to the same private uh, zone. Yes, however, I, I usually prefer to differentiate between them to make sure that I have fault tolerance when someone failed, like one of them failed or delete, for example. Now it should take a few minutes and I'm going to pause and con continue now continuing. Now I see both net, both uh, private end uh, private endpoints are created, back end and front end. Now let's go to front end. This is the client. This is my virtual machine. I'm trying to connect. This time it gives me a connection partially, so it connects to the workspace and then move to another URL. It's called Canada Central PL dash auth and then azure dataprex.net and then stopped it gives me cannot reach out to this page this is important so to to investigate this i'm gonna use just ns lookup to check where is my dns is pointing to so i'm gonna do ns lookup for the the authentication or pl auth the authentication endpoint and it referred to a public endpoint not the private IP now let's check the private uh, the, the private endpoint for the front end it's created it's inside the uh, the private endpoint the, sorry the, the private DNS zone and this is the name of the workspace so this name is pointing to the IP that we are seeing here 10.1.6.0 uh, four. So let's try this name and see what NS lookup is giving me. Yes, 10.1.6.8 actually, sorry. So this IP is a private IP and it, it works fine. So I can resolve to private IP the URL of the workspace. However, when the, when the workspace is sending me to the Azure ED to authenticate, the PL auth uh, URL, I don't have IP4. That's why it fails and it fails because of DNS error. This is very important. That's why we have the need for creating private endpoint for the other sub resource, which is the browser authentication sub resource. So now I'm creating it. This is very important to understand it. Now, do I need to have a browser authentication sub resource per workspace? No. It's one per region. So here, browser authentication. As like I might have 10 workspaces. Uh, the best practice is to create one workspace of them with this uh, private endpoint only. And this workspace should not be used for anything else. Just it's a workspace as a holder for this private endpoint for authentication for the rest of the workspaces. So continuing. DNA zone and it goes to the private DNS zone that's already created in the data resource group. Create. Creation completed. So now let's go and check the networking. Now I have the three private endpoints one back end, one front end, and then another one to help the front end for the browser authentication. Now let's look at the private DNS zones that I have. I have two private DNS zones in two different resource groups. Remember, I cannot have them in the same resource group because they have the same name, right? So I have to have them in, in two different resource group. And I see here, before I used to have only one entry, for the workspace name, now I have the workspace name and the authentication. So if I repeat again the NS lookup for the authentication endpoint, now I have a private endpoint or a private IP for the authentication. Now testing, refreshing the browser. And voila, now I have 
full access from my client to my workspace. Let's go and test creating a compute resource or a cluster, Spark cluster. Creating it. Seeing the event log. And here we go. Done. Refreshing. I see the driver is healthy. Everything is working fine as expected. All right. So now we secured all the communication between the user to the control plane and between the control plane to the data plane using private endpoints. Now all the communications are isolated through these private endpoints. That's not 100% correct. What I, I just said is actually correct, but these are the communication between the client and the control plane and between the control plane and the data plane. But this is not all the communication. And this is the incorrect part. So let me explain this and I will go to the whiteboard in a second. Every time you click on start cluster, let's say your cluster is 10 nodes. Now, Databricks is creating 10 machines. What if you you had the cluster before, you just stopped it for two, three hours. The cluster is deleted. The all the virtual machines are deleted. Then the all the virtual machine will be recreated back again. In the recreation part, we have images. These images actually are Ubuntu Linux. So there is a storage account owned and operated by Dataplex, Dataplex where the cluster will copy all the images from the storage account to create the, 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 the disks. The disks themselves, they will be managed by Dataplex. The Ubuntu updates, so there is a communication going to Ubuntu to pull the, the security updates. There is Cloudflare for security. There, is, there are many other uh, storage accounts used internally by Microsoft monitoring because they are collecting all the telemetry data for monitoring. So if something happened and you call Microsoft support or Databricks support, Microsoft and Databricks are combined into the support for, for Azure Databricks. So you call them and you tell them something happened. They must have, they must have logs to investigate what's happening. All these are communication channels, and that includes communication communication to the, uh, the, the, the hive or the, the external meta store, which is actually a MySQL database. You see there is a SQL communication going to the, the MySQL port. And that's, if you remember at the first, probably first part of the series, when we had the NSG, there was an NSG allow uh, rule for the SQL, the outbound to SQL, uh, MySQL, like the port clearly is MySQL port. So for all these communication, now you need to ask yourself, do you need to have this communication passing through firewall? Yes or no? Be careful with your answer. Not because you can do it, you should do it. I will tell you why, because this is typically the, the issue that I'm facing with many of my clients, the enterprises and the governments and like all the enterprises that are security focused, this is the issue that they, we are we are having. The cloud team or the security team, they will say, no, we need to have all this traffic going to the firewall. Okay, then it will go to the firewall. Now, the documentation says you should open the traffic, any traffic going to star.blog.core.windows.net, which is like all the storage accounts, open it. Well. Sometimes people are saying, no, I don't want to open all the traffic to all the storage accounts. I want to open the traffic to specific storage accounts. Why? To answer this, you should go back to your security requirements and search for a requirement for exfiltration protection. Now, exfiltration protection means I'm protecting my environment from exfiltration. What's the exfiltration? This happens when you have a legitimate access, like you give me access, I'm part, I'm one employee at your environment, so I, I have access to Databricks. Now, inside Databricks, I can write any code, including I can download some data from the data lake and then send this data to my OneDrive or to my 
uh, Google Drive or to another storage account that is owned by me. And this is the exfiltration. Now, before you go to the extreme and say this, this is a, a use case I need to handle, know that once you do this, you must have a very agile security and cloud team because every time there is something happening in the code in Databricks, you will have a new uh, storage account needed or a new URL needed and you have to be agile to enable all these one by one. Otherwise, you are restricting your environment to the point that it's not usable anymore because there will be a data scientist who wants to use something, whatever the something is, is it, it, like it can be a, a package, it can be uh, using data from a specific location or copying data to a specific location and we will have issues with this. Even Databricks itself, like for, just for creating the cluster, and, and I, will, I will show you in, in my demo, it took me hours. I, I, I blocked everything and then started the cluster and it fails. And then I will copy all the storage accounts that I'm seeing, which is not documented, by the way. You will not find it, this in any documentation. And then I will put them into the exception list and then repeat again the process. If you don't have a security team and a cloud team responsible for the firewall, ready to do this exercise, spending hours of these. And I'm, I'm gonna help people who are watching this video and getting the resources by documenting these, but that's will be only for my region. I'm, I'm operating in Canada Central. So it depends on your region. So the point is, ask yourself, do you need to have exfiltration protection or not? Is it really a requirement or because you like to do it, that you are doing it? This is, this is very important because if you are allowing the users from to, to, to have remote work, that means they can copy the data in many other ways. So exfiltration protection will be a questionable in this case. But if you'd like to do it, yes, the technology allows you to do it. However, don't ask Databricks or Microsoft representatives, give me a, a, a complete list of all the storage accounts that are used. You will not get any luck with this. Anyways, go to the whiteboard and explain it. So far, we created the private endpoint, this one, between the control plane and the data plane. And we created another private endpoint, that one, between the control plane and the user, or the, the, the VNet that has the, the users, the workstations. And all the communication is going through these, as long as these communication between these three network areas or these three uh, VNets. Now, at the time of creating the cluster, the cluster needs to communicate with some resources, some of them inside Azure. We are speaking about Azure Databricks, some of them outside Azure. So what I did is I, I created first a link here, peering. So this is peering. And I put a firewall. This is firewall. And I sent all the traffic using uh, UDR or user defined routing. So the, I created the UDR here and there for both of them to send all the traffic from these two subnets that is going outside, going to zero, 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 slash zero. I will send it first to the firewall. And by default, I started the firewall without any uh, exceptions. And then I, I, I logged in, I started to create a cluster, it fails. And then I repeated this process so many times until I found, I, I put all the exceptions there. So let me show you how I did this and I will skip quickly until the, the end result. You will not suffer with me all the hours I spent on this one. To integrate firewalls in Azure, we are using routing tables. So I, I have a routing table assigned to the subnets Databricks 1, Databricks 2. And the only rule there is I'm sending all the traffic outside my VNet to the next hub is this IP. And this IP is the IP for the firewall. As you can see, this is the same IP for the firewall. And I'm also sending all the diagnostic settings for this firewall. This is Azure Firewall to Log Analytics Workspace. So anytime there is uh, a block happens or deny happens, I can get access to it. I can I can run a report and I can see these. 
and then I'm creating a cluster as we are expecting this cluster will fail and what I'm doing is I'm gonna see why it fails so here is the failure and why it fails would be by reading the logs from the firewall so I see that these are the storage accounts or the storage accounts in this case and what I'm doing is I'm copying them compare the the list I have if it's a new uh, URL then I'm, I'm taking it again this is only for the uh, Canada Central region and I kept repeating until at the end I have a successful uh, creation for the cluster I'm going to show you now the network rules and the application rules that I have with Azure Firewall now depends on which which firewall you are using the, the interface of course would be different and the naming might be different so here I have in the network rules what I have is I have traffic going to event hub traffic going to the uh, network uh, time protocol MySQL on the MySQL port and ICMP and I was I was very uh, flexible with these rules so in here I'm, I am having the traffic for example with this one the traffic is going to all the uh, Canada regions for event hub so event hub Canada Central event hub Canada East the same thing goes for uh, the UDP like there's no nothing in Azure this is just for adjusting the time of the machine so it's a time service and it's a UDP protocol here this is the uh, MySQL and MySQL I opened it for all the SQL traffic uh, so here so all the SQL uh, traffic using the uh, service tag if you would like to have it specific to uh, the, the, the server that is used by MySQL in Azure as, as the hive uh, or the external uh, main store yes you can always uh, do this and by providing specific one I was this uh, I was more restrictive actually in the application rules so in the application rules I have for example Ubuntu um, I'm saying I'm allowing the traffic going to ubuntu.com for the uh, storage databricks these like typically databricks storage accounts or the storage account used by databricks they, they use, used to have always like Databricks at the beginning or Dbricks at the beginning uh, or Dbricks storage. Uh, I let me show you here. It's, here. it's not uh, clear here. So for example, I have them. So these are Databricks storage accounts. Uh, you this one is a specific one. This storage account it always start with DB storage uh, SB. So this is the DBFS. This is the main Databricks file system and this is pair uh, workspace so every workspace will have its own storage account and this is created as part of the workspace creation and you will find it in the managed uh, resource group so again this is one that easy to you can get the others are like Databricks logs Databricks artifacts you can you can find them uh, they are documented actually uh, but these are not documented you will not find documentation for these. These are mainly used by Azure monitoring, the backend monitoring to collect the needed logs for support. I found them uh, like this, the, most of them. I have Cloudflare as well. And until now, I didn't use anything, like I just created the cluster. But if someone created a cluster and then tried to install a package on it, that would be something else. Then it would be PyPy.org or something like this. Uh, so it depends on the use case. You will find from time to time you uh, URLs showing up and some of these URLs will be changed over time there is no documentation that means there is no guarantee it will always be the same like this so uh, I actually exported my uh, my my policy my my Azure firewall policy which has everything here I will include it as well uh, as an article in my blog when I publish this video so you will have access to these Hopefully that will help you. That's it. With this, we are ending the last episode in the, the Azure Databricks networking deep dive uh, series. In this episode, we discussed mainly two, two topics. The first one, how can we secure the traffic between the user and the control plane through the front end private endpoint. And we discussed the, the, the role of the uh, 
the authentication endpoint to have the authentication successful with Azure AD. And the second part, we discussed the role of firewalls. In this example, I used Azure Firewall. How can we uh, prevent the exfiltration uh, threat if that's required? And, and, and I, I give a bit of like a, a caution of not to go further with this unless it's really a requirements. But if it's requirements, then you have to route the traffic to the firewall. And I listed all the needed uh, fully qualified domain names to have a successful setup. Remember that this is only starting the cluster and you have now a function cluster. If, if a, a data engineer or a data scientist is trying to reach out to a, a web service or a website to scrap some data or downloading a, a library or a package from somewhere, then that will be by default uh, blocked. And then you have to have an agile process to unblock these. Otherwise, your, your functionality and your productivity of Databricks will be greatly affected. Thank you, and I will see you in the next video.